Why, hello there. Welcome back to the Agassino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agassino Zynga, and this is episode number 501. That's 501 of the Agassino Zynga Show. How you doing? How you feeling? Great. Amazing. Good to know. How am I? You know how it is. Doing the best I can with the time I have available. Doing the best I can with the time I have available. If it's your first time, check out the show via YouTube. You know what to do. Please smash that like button. Hit subscribe. Leave me a comment down below. That will be greatly appreciated so I can get your thoughts, feelings, suggestions on the show. And anything you want me to improve on or whatnot, you know, just chuck them all down there and I'll be replying promptly. If you're listening via the podcast app, I very much appreciate a 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 star review on the Apple Podcast. Whatever you can spare will take you at least five seconds to do. It's really quick. And, you know, obviously those ratings help to get the podcast boots up the charts and it help it get discovered and all that malarkey. You know how it is on the Internet. You know, you engage with stuff, you interact with it. Um, you don't just merely watch, you share and all that stuff and people recognize it. And then you can kind of get, you know, put in the algorithm and all that good stuff. And who knows? Maybe I can become the next Larry David. Weird example, but you get my drift. And of course, support via Patreon is welcome too at patreon.com forward slash Agostino. That's patreon.com forward slash A-G-O-S-T-I-N-H-O. You can find the link in the description of this video you're watching or the podcast you're listening to right now. You can find the description there and find the link, click it. And they'll get, take it to Patreon. You get a bonus episode of the Patreon show. I uploaded one last week. One's coming at the end of this week. So make sure you go on there. Bonus content for my Patreon subscribers only available via patreon.com forward slash A-G-O-S-T-I-N-H-O. That's my first name, Agostino. Go on there. Subscribe today for those one dollar equivalent of one pound per month. You get access to all my bonus content only available on Patreon. Don't delay. Get involved on there today. Boom. But yeah, we're back. Hope you're good wherever you may be. I'm doing flipping amazing, as I've told you. I've had a good gym session today. Um, had a little cheeky McDonald's today. A couple of chicken selects and some fries. Um, fasting the next day. Back to the gym again. Got my green juices. Got my protein bars. Getting on it. Because the plan is, hopefully, fingers crossed, I'm going to go to Bergheim end of the month. End of next month, if not the beginning of November. So sometime within the next month and a half, I'll be in Berlin streets. I'll be stomping around in my big New Rock boots, you know, swagging it out, mobbing it out on my ones, hanging out, doing the vibe. So if you happen to be around there, holler at the kid around that time. But I still want to get myself in peak physical condition to be able to go and survive that monumental trip of just getting on it and raving and jumping up and down. Now, the issue, the interesting part about Berlin, right, is that it's not just merely an issue of just going out there and it being drugs, alcohol and sex and stuff. Right. That obviously can happen if you want to do so. But it's just a, it's just a kind of, you know, when you, like, you go to a Mediterranean country, like when I first went to Spain, I didn't understand why you shouldn't eat so much in the morning really early because we're used to having breakfast before what, 12 a.m. Right. Or 12 p.m. Sorry. But obviously in Spain, they have really late lunches and then maybe they have like a dinner later or maybe a late lunch and maybe a late lunchy breakfast thing. And then a big dinner at the end, right at the end of the day, like, you know, 10 p.m., 11 p.m. Sometimes crazy. Right. When you think about it. So when you go on holiday for the first time to a country like that, you you kind of can get caught out where you kind of think, oh, no, I've not eaten enough in the morning. I need to eat more because I'm not going to eat nothing until the evening. But they're like, no, you're going to eat something super big in the evening, probably combining your lunch and your and your breakfast. You're better off just legitimately having like maybe a slice of a Spanish omelette or a couple of croissants and a coffee. You, that would be it. Just do that and you'll be cool. Trust me. And at the time, you don't believe the person when they're telling you. You don't believe your guests, your company, whoever it is, because you think they're hating. You think they're trying to stop your flow. And then by the time it gets to dinner, you're like, oh, shit, I've kind of shit the bed here. Do you know what I mean? I really kind of overshot my... Uh, overshot my load as they say <laughs> in the gross industry and then you end up kind of being in a place where you can't eat any of the delicious food which is you know obviously amazing produce because it's just too full up and i think the same happens in berlin because of our pace of raving which is again i think even though i've said i've noticed a difference in the attendances of people going out or the, or the, the amount of people that are going out um, i've definitely recognized a shift Anyone that's been out to a lot of the kind of trendier clubs in London can definitely attest to that. There's probably a lot more club kids in the clubs now, which is great because they provide light, inspiration and just kind of energy because they're always dancing, they're always stunting, they're always high off their face on speed or whatever, right? And they're just getting after it, right? And it's cool to see people just go into a club with the um, with the kind of... Um, 
number one thing in their mind is to just dance sweat their faces off and make sure they can take off as many pieces of clothing as possible and just gyrate from side to side wearing their flipping go fast glasses and stuff right that's awesome you like that i like to see that everyone likes to see that um but there's no denying that there's more space for them because everyone else who was out is probably has probably moved on i don't know what's happened maybe it's a tourism maybe people kind of aged out of it maybe they've just discovered new interests maybe they don't care whatever there's definitely a change in the kind of amount of people that are outside and stuff so that's good but in general we still go out early normal hours right we're still going out between the hours of like what 9 p.m and 4 a.m and most berlin clubs don't start until like 12 and go on maybe until the afternoon sometimes you know until the next day so in order to kind of have the endurance to survive those kind of nights out you need to be in peak physical conditioning not meaning that you have to be super fit but just in terms of your endurance of going out and because i haven't been i just need to get myself to a fit level so that at least i have the base amount of um so i have the necessary low amount of weight right body mass index that would allow me to jump up and down in the spot and dance because the last one i want to do is take a break um because you know the longest time i think i spent in burger must have been like my record must have been like saying like 16 hours or something obviously this time it's different because if i'm not mistaken the friday when panorama bars open it's just panorama bar so then you just leave and it closes and it starts getting on saturday but i think you cannot no actually you can actually probably stay i think throughout the entire duration so if you went on a friday you could go to panorama bar until saturday night 9.50, whatever, 11.59, when the new timetable starts, and then go to Berghain and then kind of stay there until, because I think, if I'm not mistaken, Berghain closes on the Monday morning, so sometime around Monday, 8 a.m., which is when, why usually a lot of people tend to get the flight on the Tuesday, or they try to get the early flight on the Monday, like at 6, and then leave at like a 3 or something, right, take your luggage with you on a Monday, and you just go straight from the club to the airport and go out. And big up those savages. I know the savages six stuff. I miss a few of them on the dance floor. Those savages that were just going straight from work to, to, to yeah, basically going straight to work from the Burger and Club floor, which is nuts. And this was back in the day when we used to go to offices. Now it's better because we're all working from home. If you have got an office job, you're definitely working from home or doing some sort of mixture of remote working and working maybe in the office. But that's obviously way more um you can handle that sort of thing but imagine going into an actual office or to especially if you your office is based in the sort of what would you call it a bustling kind of workspacey sort of environment imagine having to leave the craziness of a club go into a plane all that nonsense your head is spinning you're still on the calm down having to get on public transport to then go into your place of work and then be attentive in meetings and stuff you stink because that's the one thing as well you realize when you go to clubs in berlin like you forget what it's like to be in a nightclub where everyone's smoking inside and you know i have to hold my hands up i'm one of them too i don't even smoke cigarettes but when you get to a place like that you see everyone else smoking cigarettes you want to be cool you want to be part of the crowd and you end up buying yourself a, a pack of cigarettes from the little vending machine absolutely insane <laughs> and then you end up kind of there's puffing away like an absolute idiot not actually inhaling of course because you can't smoke like myself you know i'm not actually a smoker so you end up just trying to stunt and look cool and pose with everybody else so i'm gonna try and get myself in as best physical shape i can like i said before i lost a bunch of weight before i'm gonna just up the ante with the cardio i've been going to gym quite regularly now three times a week just lifting weights and doing a bit of a crossfit at the end like in terms of um endurance or no basically cardio sort of stuff at the end of the workout like a like a workout of the day sort of vibe so i'll go on a rowing machine then do a couple of um kettlebell swings the other day i did like 400 meters rowing machine three times um then 25 kettlebell swings in between sets whatever and then obviously you kind of time that so that's pretty good way to sort of add in the cardio element so you're burning as much as possible but you still have to go out and run and it is what it is so gonna up the ante on that that should be good and then hopefully like i said berlin maybe either the end of the the weekend the last weekend of october or the first weekend of november but either way i'm going i am bloody going and i cannot wait really am looking forward to it man i'm kind of itching i've been looking at loads of videos and stuff and replaying some of my old videos and reviews that i've been when i go in there myself because a lot of people found those useful which is great people have messaged me off the back of those and said oh yeah i saw your video about when you went how the experience was so it'd be good to do a recap post pandemic because this is obviously i did one before i did one the last time i went it'd be good to do another one now obviously since it kind of reopened and it being the first month it'd be bloody sweet so let's see man let's bloody see apart from that obviously united are playing later today um 
Let's see what I go on. Big game, must win game against Villarreal. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer telling us it's not a must win game, but it clearly is. But, you know, I don't know. Let's wait and see in that one. We'll, we'll talk about that another time. But anyway, loads of stuff to talk about in the show today. Jam packed, jam packed show. So give yourself a little drink. I've got myself a glass of water here. I've got another green juice in the fridge. I've got a couple of um, cold brews brewing in the fridge at the moment, actually. I'm all prepared up. I've got so many liquids that are going inside my body. Make sure you've got yours and let's bloody go. Oi! Number one news on the day, which just popped up on my feed. This is courtesy of Hot Dinners. It says Popeye's Chicken is coming to London, starting with Westfield Stratford. Cool, isn't it? Westfield Stratford is going to get a Popeye's Chicken. Absolutely fantastic. Um, obviously there was a big deal around um Popeye's, the big hype and hoopla last year or maybe a couple of years ago was the chicken sandwich that everyone was going crazy about and queuing. Remember all that nonsense? Like. I I I kind of list the po people going crazy over Popeye's chicken sandwiches in the same sort of company as everyone kind of pretending that Ted Lasso is some like you know um, amazing TV series, right? It's good enough. It's decent. It kind of allows you to whittle away the day if you got nothing else to do and you want to just waste some time and maybe laugh internally. Then Ted Lasso is a kind of thing for you. But people are pretending that it's anything like Curb Your Enthusiasm or whatever it may be, or it's some new thing, or people should care, like let's relax the main guy in it he's you know his missus got flipping taken off of him from bloody harry styles that's why people care about it a little bit of sympathy he's obviously really like a, a funny comedic actor or a good comedic actor regardless whatever you put a good push you put a good show together and this is what it is same with the chicken sandwich it was it really that good that it warranted cues it warranted people kind of having fights with flipping popeye's chicken sandwich and um, workers god bless them like all those really ridiculous videos like there was a time in my life where i was queuing for burgers right I, i'm not proud of it but no, actually i am proud of it that was a time when i was I, I thought i was a food blogger i forgot what i had it was before my blog i have now at the moment the uh, default goon um, dot wordpress.com obviously no custom url on that one because i don't tell myself seriously but there was a time where i was like a quote-unquote food blog i'd write these little reviews and sometimes you'd get little vouchers and you'd be invited to tasting sessions and shit and you know i'm sure if i would have kept at it the fact that i'm a token black guy would have definitely helped my career prospects but i didn't necessarily care too tough about it i've always kind of viewed food as like a fuel source i'm not really as much as i enjoy going to these nice places i'm not i wouldn't say a classical foodie in that i can lose myself in flipping um turnips and you know certain kinds of onions or caramelization i just don't care i don't care enough for that but i do remember a time where i cared deeply about burgers this was a time when the whole burger tr trend had kind of seeped its way over to um england it might have been around the 20 i don't know 2015 2013 era of time but regardless of what it was we'd go all around the country all around london specifically to tasting all these amazing burgers popping up in different pubs doing pop-up kitchens which again was a great invention too whoever started that um it kind of allowed loads of bars and pubs to basically get a whole set of new clientele coming into your space it gave them a destination to go to you could then kind of recycle through with different people you could become partners whatever loads of things happen in the back of that and that was actually a great thing because there's a lot of complexity 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 but it goes into it regardless of what the word is in terms of the meat in terms of how it's constructed in terms of the buns in terms of how it's uh you know made barbecued whatever it may be and of course the people that we went to go see they've now become you know multi-millionaires off the back of those burgers right you think of people like uh meat liquor and these kind of establishments right absolutely smashing stuff and patty and bun all these kind of places um and of course pay people like five guys and all those big chains came over and essentially just took over the market but still facts remain um but i've been interested to see what happens when popeye's chicken does open up in westford shafford will people queue up in the same way they did with all the other queues that happened in the states or people just move on because as great Popeye's chicken was when i went the first time i went to go taste Popeye's chicken is when we went to like a boys holiday my first and probably only boys holiday with more than like three people i'd say you call it that right a boys holiday is probably more than three people that was maybe what 2011 or something like that right um maybe 18 19 i think around there i think so and then um we went to a boys holiday to new york it was amazing one of the best ones um 
I kind of regret not kind of keeping in touch with all those guys. I miss them deeply, but unfortunately, you know, life got in the way. I couldn't be bothered to keep in contact. They made an effort definitely over the years, and I just didn't respond well to it. And, you know, everyone's kind of gone on their separate ways now. Unfortunately, we're all too old to kind of rekindle that sort of friendship in any kind of meaningful way. But still, one of the best trips ever. I, I ended up hooking up with one of the hottest girls I've ever hooked up with in my entire life. It's some hostel. I think it was called... Um, I think it was something like I was was it it was like Metropolis or something like that. One one of those weird names, but I think it closed down because it wasn't fit for purpose. Uh, after we left, actually, um, it was like a ridiculously cheap hostel, like I don't know, twenty thirty dollars per night. And then, if I'm not mistaken, next door or underneath the hostel, there was this place or bar where you could buy, where every pint you bought gave you a free pizza if you wanted it. And then in in order, for, I guess if you want to add toppings, it was like a dollar on top for a topping, but you just got a little seven inch cheese, uh, pizza, cheese and tomato pizza, which is fucking banging. And I think it was like a student bar sort of place, right? But a great concept. Um, you, you get a pint of beer and you get like a free pizza. So it's a good way, of course, for the bar too, to make sure no one's leaving too fucked up because then, you know, you got, you're, you're soaking up all the alcohol with those pizza. Um, but yeah, I ended up hooking up with one of the most hottest girls I hooked up with in my entire life at, at that, at, at from that hostel she was an english girl actually ironically enough and it was funny as well because there was two guys in the hostel that we were kind of competing for her kind of love or affection attention and it's cool that with dudes for the most part i'm not sure how it is with girls but with dudes we are quite like gracious maybe to each other's faces maybe behind the scenes we're effing and blinding and you know sending evil vibes out to the other guy's way but usually in front of each other we're very good at kind of being gracious and be like you know what you bested me there she obviously clearly likes you i'll step away and we're also aware of who the flipping favorite is but we'll try anyway i think that's really admirable as well because you never know right you might be the hotter dude you might be the more compatible dude but she might want something completely different so you just try you put your effort in anyway and wherever she selects again women are always in control of these situations no matter how much they try to feign like you know that they're damsels in distress really and truly if a woman doesn't choose you you're not getting no action if she doesn't say yes you're kind of going you know you're kind of going home with your balls in your hands so um she gracefully and thankfully said yes to me at that time even though i had zero game at that age um i was still kind of like whoa i couldn't believe it was actually happening at the time but it was such a kind of great experience right to experience that going over there going to supreme going to places like you know popeyes buying a 40 ounce from a shop from a bodega sorry going to harlem and seeing all the puerto ricans like, oh, it was it was amazing and i remember going to popeyes for the first time and i really enjoyed it right it was fucking fantastic but again at that time, food, culture, and kind of fried chicken spots in the UK weren't as good as what they had in America. But now we have quite a lot, especially in London. We have that mother, mother clucker. I forgot what the other one was it's called as well. I think it's Cockfighter. We have another one. But there's a few chicken establishments that are doing really great work at the moment, right, here in London. And even KFC. Again, people like to scoff on KFC, but KFC is pretty decent, man. For what it is, like for high street stuff, like sim, 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 don't get me wrong, it's maybe not a similar quality level or like standard consistency as what McDonald's is. Most McDonald's you go to around the world or even in the country, they're always going to be a six or seven out of 10. Solid, but I found with KFC and Burger King, they kind of, there's too much um, disparity between the consistency and the quality of and the, and the standard of quality between different restaurants. It's just too much. Like even where I live now, there's like two KFCs and half an hour from each other and the service and the level of stuff you get is way different from wherever you go, which is weird, but hey. But I do remember one thing for KFC was that the chicken portion of the tenders was so big because we're so used to having our tenders be like that size. Like, I don't know, like a, I don't know. How, what would you call that? Like the size of a, maybe a credit card or something. But then you go to America and their size of their tenders or their strips are like the size of two credit cards in length. And I remember getting a box meal one day. You know, when you're on holiday and you, at the time I had, I had some money because I was reselling loads of shoes. Um, I was doing that whole lark and a lot of the guys there didn't really have much money. So people were kind of scraping by, you know, helping each other out, lending people money, buying this, buying that. And the standard thing that we'd always do, because, you know, we, first time we were in America and we were living young kids and our belly couldn't handle shit, we'd buy a meal. And we're just like, if you couldn't finish, you just give it to somebody else and they'd gracefully eat it. And I remember buying a box meal, standard meal with like some... I think I got like gravy and some sort of mash or something. I forgot what I got and a nice drink. The drinks were amazing, of course. They got all these selections, way more than just, you know, Coke, Tango and Flipping Oasis. I think it was like seven or eight um, options. I remember eating that box, like a quarter of it, giving it to my friends and legitimately turning around and seeing like four people huddled around the box. 
that that meal managed to feed five people and it felt food, food meal really well and it obviously gave them a little kick um during the afternoon we were just walking around the city having a lot of fun and shit and i remember leaving and thinking wow man america's mad isn't it you could buy a box meal of that size and that could be enough to legitimately feed a family it's absolutely insane so i'm wondering if the level if the kind of size and the, all that sort of stuff is going to be similar to what they have in the states i guess not no it's not it's no secret but i thought that's what made it quite special but i'm not sure if a te if a chicken burger is going to be that flipping what's that thing called i'm not sure if a chicken burger is going to be that mind-blowing for us here in the uk considering again how um how much we've kind of upped the levels in our levels of kind of how much we've upped the levels how much we've kind of improved in terms of our culinary options and people also doing great fried chicken i'm not sure if it's going to be the best if it's going to be received as well as it should be but we can only hope it says here in the article given five guys fairly massive rollout in the uk it was only a matter of time before the u.s chain started to heading this way we've already had the return of wendy's and join them soon as american chicken juggernaut popeyes the first london location much like wendy's before it will be in stratford although popeyes location will be in westfield they're also hoping to open 350 restaurants across the country so let's hope the chicken shortage doesn't last long mad it's also part of a big worldwide rollout uh, as the man in charge of the company beyond um behind popeyes thinks they can be the biggest chicken player in the world so they're actually going for kfc that's interesting to see like i said from what i've had recently of kfc i had it what a couple of weeks ago and i i forgot how tasty it legitimately was especially like the box meals that they do with the gravy and whatnot like it's pretty decent um it's like what under a tenner i think it's like eight pound or nine pound or something fairly good value for money again if you order from a good one the quality is really good um if they can complete that would be flipping cool to see on the market because at the moment in terms of that level of chicken the only ones they're competing with are like the local boss mans right or like the what they called um the pepes and those kind of like off-key ones right um and those aren't really the best they were good when they first started i remember when they first popped up around um where i live in london they were really good they were a great little option and i don't know what happened to them maybe the, the stand the, the quality standards dropped new investors had to cut corners with their you know ingredients something happened and it wasn't as good as it was before but you know what can you do it says here yeah, popeye started in louisiana back in 1972 and currently has well over 3,000 restaurants they've been particularly big in recent years um when the chicken sandwich became an instant massive success selling out the restaurants across america that's what something of a sensation where it lasted but what about the rest of the menu it looks like the surface of rather oh, it looks like on the surface rather than similar to another u.s chicken brand we can think of but there are differences like cajun flowered um sandwiches while sides include mash and gravy and biscuits yeah they love biscuits i think that's what i got i think i got mash gravy and biscuits out there the american kind we'll have more info on the menu when it gets closer to opening so no oh, no kind of news on the opening or where exactly what's it's going to be or when it's going to open but there is obviously a plan to open a Popeyes in Westfield and that's going to be woo, that's going to be ram jammer man I think I think people I take it back I think people in Westfield will love Popeyes for sure the kind of people that go to Popeyes in Westfield I mean Westfield in general to go eat and just shop around would definitely love it next on the list we have this just want to give a shout out to Kanye West and say big up Kanye for being the person who single-handedly um brought about the resurrection or the kind of conversation around how great Demna is as a designer and how important he is for the fashion industry and how underrated or underappreciated his time at Vetemont was and obviously I'm a massive fanboy of Demna I've got many many pieces from Vetemont over the years that I've worn to absolute death if you see me around town you would have known the stuff that I've worn I've obviously got the jacket that kind of been wearing recently that sort of um flip on the can of goose i've got the hoodie that he wore famously with lord back in the day i've got a few t-shirts um i've just got many things that kind of tie into that era um got a couple of other hoodies um a hat a mask bare things and personally it's just a thing for me that i've always kind of connected with obviously with its kind of central european roots and the fact that i'm sort of obsessed with that part of europe and the fact that I've got an interest in watching series from that part of the world. I've obviously followed a lot of stuff when it comes to the crime sort of aspect of it, when it comes to the Black Panthers, sorry, the Pink Panthers, and the fact that they are these international gang of jewelry thieves and thieves in general who are basically from that kind of balcony sort of region. Um, former army guys, former special ops guys, and people who generally just, you know, live a very counterculture life. 
um, you know, of course, the civil war that happened there, everything that informs them you know, in terms of his designing, in terms of where he lives, where he's from, sorry, in Georgia. There's always something that kind of resonated with Vermo. It, it, it was like an intrinsically European for me, right? In some way, shape or form. And again, maybe it's not, you know, racially something that I would connect to, but in terms of it representing the downtrodden, the kind of overlooked sectors of society, I thought definitely was something that I would kind of lend myself to. And the fact that his, again, you know, his background, he done the education, he done the time and then he kind of made this um amazing brand with no real lead person at the, at the start that's how the, the thing was it was no lead design it was all kind of done by committee with all these friends and shit then of course he came out of the shadow and said it's all him and then he kind of stepped aside and did balenciaga for a bit then he came back then he left vincent Mar and now vincent has gone back to being um you know no one designer and kind of designed by committee allegedly but we don't know but still there are many things from the previous collections that are so overlooked. And it's great to see Kanye basically flexing and reminding people how great his stuff is. I wonder if he's like got a private access to a collection of old Vetimon that I never sold because unfortunately towards the end of the time, even though I think those last couple of seasons, I think maybe 17 to 19, um, when obviously Denver stepped away and, and went to do um, Balenciaga full time, I think maybe want to be what maybe are legitimately some of the strongest years of Vetmar, like especially that last the, the season where um, it's underrated as well. The one where they're kind of on the runway, but the runway is in a McDonald's and they're sort of walking through it. That's one of the one of the strongest sections. It might be as strong as the first first selection collection they did um, in that small club somewhere in Paris that you know Jerry Lorenzo was kind of famously banging banging his head to in that YouTube video. Um, but yeah, one fantastic designer, really, really rate him. And this is a page, Curtis, this is a page from Instagram, Curse of a user called KazKaz999. And he's great because he kind of lists all the outfits and breaks them down in terms of what certain person's wearing from the Kanye's to the Rockies, all these kind of people. But mostly I check out for the Kanye stuff because, you know, the Rocky stuff, mostly if I see it, if I, if I see him wearing, I'm just not going to wear it. Especially if I have it in my wardrobe already. It's just, you know, the last thing you want people to tell you, you've got that ASAP Rocky jacket. I can't, I can't be having that. So he broke down what Kanye recently wore to Diddy's party, the one where there was red lights somewhere dimly lit and they was all mobbing out. And he had like, you know, his Kanye garb on and he especially had head to toe Vetemar, head to toe Demna. Um, Kanye was wearing, it says here, Balenciaga uh, LED frame glasses with the LED lights on, obviously um, illuminating the logo. Um, you got the full Winter 18 Vetemar Marilyn Manson printed shirt, which obviously you would understand, obviously, with his kind of kinship with Mary Lemans over the last few years um which is basically brought up on because Kanye seems to have an obsession or he feels responsible for people who he feels like get cancelled or get treated unfairly by the public especially people who are like formerly um people that everyone used to like love and adore then they make a mistake and then he kind of feels response he kind of feels like he needs to step in and remind people to be more humane and whatnot obviously in Marilyn Manson's case it's a bit hard to say that because he has been accused of you know essay you know as they say in youtube speak um i think that woman from westworld really, really detailed account of how she felt like she was in a very toxic relationship with him and some things might have happened some things might not happen but it wasn't some light you know he said the wrong thing or he made a joke about some dead kids in the school if from a school shooting no he he actually did something to a few let's say to some women allegedly um which some people did, obviously didn't like which eventually led to him didn't he get like cancelled from a festival? So I don't know. Loads of things happened to him. And obviously you, you obviously saw him at the Donda release. He wasn't looking the best. Looking like he's been ordering all the Uber Eats. But yeah, regardless, he's got that shirt on. He's got distressed wide leg jeans from 14 to 21. He made, he's actually made them look quite wearable. Um, he's got the Heron Preston and Nike gloves, which look great on him on there. And interesting as well that he's wearing a lot more Nike out in public nowadays because I guess he's a billionaire and he doesn't really care what people say about him and what people at Adidas maybe say in terms of their emails going through, but I'm sure it's not something that they would like. And then he's got the full winter Balenciaga microphone flip sandals, which kind of look at the top. They have this very kind of geisha -y, you know, japanese vibe, but in the bottom it just kind of look like a standard um, Haviana that you would find on the streets of Rio. But yeah, a fairly sick outfit. Again, um, credit to Kanye for resurrecting Vetemar on his own reminding people how much of a sick brand it is i also like the fact that he's doing this whole face mask thing everywhere he goes mostly um it's i think the face mark has been a great thing for celebrities isn't it because there was that period in time where everyone was kind of laughing at tom was it no 
uh, Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio for going around and kind of covering his face with a coat and jacket. He didn't want to be seen. He didn't want to be bothered. He just wanted to kind of move around the world incognito. But now you legitimately can if you're a celebrity. You, unless, obviously, the number eight people will notice you if they saw a camera snapping and maybe shouting your name as they're trying to get your attention and shit. But most people won't know, recognize you if you put a mask on. I know I wouldn't recognize fucking david beckham down the street if he had a fucking face mask on i might be like i might do a double take but i'm not going to go over and say hi is it you can you put your mask down i'm not just going to leave him alone keep it moving i think that's what they all wanted that ability to kind of be like oh yeah you can just move around people might know it's you in the back of their head but there's not going to be like a trail of people like trying to stop you to get pictures and shit but yeah the shirt looks boss i see him walking through this how i'm they have one of those weird things, those weird kind of rich guy session things they do where they all sit around listening to each other's music or the music that they've already heard. I don't know, it's just it's just a bizarre world to live in, isn't it? I'm sure it's enjoyable though. And yeah, there's, there's the LED glasses, the Vetmon shirt with Marilyn Manson, the great distressed wide leg jeans, the really cool hair and Preston gloves that he did with Nike, great sandals there from balenciaga like all really well done maybe it's just me maybe i'm in the minority here but i think the outfit is fucking sick i think he absolutely smashed it i gotta be completely honest so yeah big up kanye big up denma reminding everybody that he is the most important designer in fashion even though all the fashion heads like to tell you is raf simmons who i love as well but let's be honest in terms of being able to appeal to the fashion hipsters and snobs and all the show studio diet prada type people and the people on twitter writing dissertations about met gala looks he can survive, he can he can kind of satisfy those guys he can satisfy just people that just want to drip and also satisfy people that just want to clout and have like you know those um sock trainers on or the triple s's that i have and stuff like that that's a talent in itself i think that's a talent in itself we continue on yeah this is a good one so this is a crazy video, right? Courtesy of the public freakout subreddit that I'm always kind of on and checking from time to time because I like to remind myself of how disgusting and downtrodden and outright awful humans can be in you know in all the in all their guises all around the world. And this is a great example of it. And this is also a great example for people who will go out there and say stuff like, Oh, you should never hit women. Oh, I don't see there's any reason why you should ever get in a situation where you should hit a woman. As if to say there's no instance in your entire life that you can think of that would make somebody snap to the point where they'd want to physically assert themselves on a woman or whoever kind of did the, you know, did the bad thing to them. And I've always thought that sort of stuff was really disingenuous because it kind of assumes that women are just infallible they just don't have anything that they could do that could ever press especially a dude's buttons to the point where you want to hurt them and i think it's really also um it's purpose it's purposefully um naive because we've all grown up we've all kind of you know been young once and we know there are kids especially boys who they don't know how to communicate verbally they only know how to communicate you know physically through violence or through wrestling or just through fucking around they don't have any way of kind of articulating their words so it's really dumb i think to suggest that you could ever be in a situation where there would be no instance where a guy who is you know has from birth has always been somebody has been very tactile hands-on full of energy doesn't necessarily know how to sit down maybe then turns to get into you know have life experiences that maybe turn him into being a little bit of an angry dude how he couldn't get to a point where he's arguing with a woman who of course has a better way of arguing with her words than you do because she's never had in her entire life had to use her physical prowess to win an argument or to assert herself it's no coincidence that a guy could just not get to a point where there's nothing else he can say that's going to help him win the argument. So the only way he knows how to win the argument, the only way he knows how to bring things back in his favour, is to do the old slap a -roo. Which, of course, I don't condone, don't get me wrong. But again, this is proof, this video specifically is proof, that there is sometimes occasions in um, scenarios where maybe hitting a woman, especially a woman that you don't know, because again, I know people think, oh, you don't hit a woman, cool, I understand. But sometimes hitting a woman you don't know makes a whole lot of sense in this sort of scenario and this video is of a red sox game i'm not sure if red sox are baseball or football i'm assuming if baseball um there's a guy sitting down a woman with her hands crossed arguing with a dude and the girl that she's with and from what i can ascertain um she was in maybe the wrong seats but didn't want to move and told those guys to go move to the other seats and the other her friends did but she wanted to stay there and make a point and i guess they got into that argument that people do where they get into an argument and they don't want to like 
lose face so they just stand there and just keep bickering and then we just see what happens here And she spits on him. And she spits on him. Now, I don't know if those two guys are together. I don't know if the guy and the girl are together or if she's just somebody separate. But I would be really disappointed if I was out with a girl and my girlfriend and we're in a situation where I was trying to show maximum restraint in a situation where I did nothing wrong and a, another girl came up and spat at me. I would expect my friend who's seen me show restraint to step in for me and, you know, hit the girl on my behalf or at least push her but do something right i would appreciate that very much i wouldn't appreciate just like oh my god that's so out of order like i don't want that don't don't out of order me because in that instance spitting on somebody is one of the lowest things you can ever do and it's one of those things that if you ever did it if it was a guy on guy thing there is no like, words of being exchanged it's straight arms it's straight violence it's straight headbutts knees elbows pinching punching of the balls squeezing of the balls twisting of the nut whatever loads of violence is going down if that happens someone maybe even stick a finger up your bum right in that respect someone's gonna do something but it's incredible to think that we've got to a point in life where men are in a position where they are not even i'm sure in his mind something happened in the beginning of the argument where he switched he was like i don't care what she does because clearly she was at a point where she's lost her point she's lost her reasons to stand there and bicker with you so you know she's willing to do anything to kind of make herself feel like she's the moral victor in this argument, right? So you have to turn a switch in your head that tells you, no matter what she does, I'm not going to react. Which is difficult because, again, she could have kicked you in the nuts. She could have spat on you. She could have, I don't know, said something derogatory about your parents that were there. I don't know. She could have done something that could have touched anyone's buttons, right? Or even that guy specifically buttons. We don't know what his buttons are, but she could have said something that could have been like, you know what? No one says that to me and here we go, Tasmanian devil. But he must have decided early on in interaction not to say it because he doesn't even move. He doesn't even stand up. She spits on him and he just continues walking like looking straight out to the field where they're playing baseball. And it's like, wow. Like that is proof, in my opinion, that there are some women sometimes that unfortunately might deserve a little elbow. I deserve a little push. Deserve a little uppercut. Might deserve a little right hook, left hook, something, a little jab. Especially in this case, like what's a dude meant to do? What's a well-behaved guy meant to do? Just cross his hands and say, "Oh yeah, my bad." Like even if he says something again, this guy seems pretty well chilled, well well mannered. Seems pretty chill. Like you know, they're going back and forth. He's saying, "Hey, you know, Melissa, your friends have been calling you the whole day. You've always been, you've been in the wrong." So again, we don't know what's happening. Maybe they are in the wrong, but regardless, we're at this point now where more likely than not. You're causing a nuisance to these people. Just walk away. She doesn't. And in an effort to kind of, you know, rewrite her earlier wrongs in the argument, maybe. I don't know what she does. She just has to spit on the dude. I could have never forgive that. Really couldn't forgive that. Like, I, I don't know what I would do. I, don't even, I wouldn't even go as far as saying what I was going to do. I don't even know what I would do. That's how bad it would be. It would be that bad for me. But that is, again, definitely proof of, you know, Bill Burr's bit that there always is a reason to hit a woman or to hit anybody. There's definitely a reason. Um, you obviously don't want to do it. You want to show restraint. You don't want to get into physical altercations with anybody um, out in the streets, especially because you never know what anybody's capable of because, you know, you're not taking anyone for granted. She might be, you know, 75 kilograms soaking wet, but if she has a weapon or something sharp, she could put, you know, she, she could inflict a lot of damage. So you don't want to obviously do that sort of stuff. But God damn it. Imagine being that person. Imagine being that person that just spits loogies at randoms because you're not happy that they kind of took your seat. It's like, huh? Uh, anyway, bizarre people, man. Bizarre people. Anyway, moving on. Interesting topic to talk about here. Very interesting. This is a clip I'm going to play next. Is... <clears throat> Sorry, I got... Those of green juice stuff stuck in my mouth still. But we move, we move, we move. Anyway, yeah. Interesting clip here that I'm going to play for you guys in a minute courtesy of joe rogan's podcast recently that he did with um burt kreischer somebody who i've kane said on the channel i'm not a fan of 
if anything, like, you know who kind of represents, like, um, what was I going to say? White privilege. <laughs> Edison Ray and Burt Kreischer, right? They're going to skirt through or sell through their entire careers. On, you can't really say Burt Kreischer, Edison, Edison, Edison Ray, because at least he's talented and he can actually, you know, he's a supreme stand-up comedian, right? Away from all the you know wheezing and the you know uh 45 days sober only the days i wasn't drinking and the insistence on bringing up his wife and children on podcasts every single day and you know the flipping stories all about me and all that sort of stuff like take away all the bo- the the bullshit in burt crash is a sick comedian like a proper top tier one right sorry about that but um, of course, on podcast, I'm just not a fan of the dude. Everything sort of has a sense around him. He has to one up things all the time. He constantly interrupts. Um, the the wheezy laughing is just a bit cringe. Like I, whatever, I'm not I'm not a fan of it. But they had a very cool in, little interaction with each other on the Joe Rogan podcast, where essentially Joe Rogan used an opportunity to kind of heap praise on Brendan Schaub, somebody of course I featured a lot on my channel in general, um, and who's somebody a lot of the internet has decided is a bit of a dumb dumb right and they're not really that big fans of him if you go and look at the fire and the kids subreddits big up all the homeless cats out there um they're not really the biggest fans of the guy and it's pretty evident to see why if you spend half an hour on that subreddit why they wouldn't be fans of him and i think it's okay not to be a fan of people and i think that's why the 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 point i was trying to make it's all right to hate on somebody that you don't know because you don't know them, right? People will say this a lot. They'll be like, oh, yeah, you should meet him. No, he's only a cool guy, man. I know him, I know him. It's like, cool, you know him, but I don't. The only way that I know this person is through this news article, this clip I've seen, this story I've read. That's all I know about this person, right? I've only known that. So I'm allowed to form a judgment, a partial judgment, even a full judgment on what I know. If it gets re later on down the line, I meet them up and I, I'll pull a Joe Budden. Do you know what I mean? What Joe Budden always does, he criticizes somebody. The moment he meets them up, he's all pally pally flicking it out for the gram. I will do that in a heartbeat too. But until I meet the person, I'm always going to just go with what I see, the information available. And it's fairly, in, again, fairly evident if you spend half an hour on the sub, on the fire and the kids subreddit, you will see that. Ben and Schaub is a bit of a piece of shit, right? Like, in his own way, right? Everyone's got a piece of shit in them, but he's clearly, like, a piece of shit. And I think he's... And I, and I think the issue that he has in general, unlike people like Tana Mogo and Trisha Paytas, I was thinking of even, like, a DSP. No, DSP is not a good example because I think he's more similar to, to um, Ben and Schaub in that way, but definitely in Tana Mogo and Trisha Paytas sort of way, they recognise how much of a piece of shit they are and they use it to their advantage. They kind of lean into it. Whereas with Brendan, I think he's got in his head that he's a decent dude or a good dude. Of course you are, because you're a good dude to Brent, to Joe Rogan because, yeah, he's Joe Rogan. You're a good dude to people that you employ because, yeah, you employ them and you need them. But to everyone else in terms of interaction, in terms of how he acts, he obviously, I won't say not a good dude, but I can see how people don't like the guy. And I think it's sort of disingenuous to assume that people just don't like him only because they don't know the dude. I think that's what Joe Rogan kind of says in the clip. And I just, I don't know. I've, I've always had a hard time with it. I don't really understand it. I think maybe because, again, I've grown up on the internet. I've been part of forum culture. I've been part of Tumblr. I know how mean people can get online. And it's never affected me, ever for the good or for the bad, especially because I've been always putting myself um, out there in terms of social media presence for the best part of my adult life. And, again, I'm not as well known as these other dudes. I understand I'm not getting as much back from people as much as those guys. But still... There should be an understanding or an acceptance that you're never going to be anyone's, everyone's cup of coffee. We're even seeing that with Joe Rogan, right? Joe Rogan, I think, is maybe one of the most, I wouldn't say safest, but he's quite middle of the road when it comes to podcast people, just entertainment figures in general in the, in the world of content creation, right? He's sort of middle of the road. Maybe in recent years, because of his whole COVID talk, and so people have kind of gone off him a little bit. Me personally, it's definitely been all the rich guy talk and uh, just the... Um, uh, the lack of, I think, self-awareness that definitely comes from money because it kind of it kind of withdraws you from society because you don't need people as much because you've got a hundred million dollars plus from Spotify, which I completely understand. But I think you should be allowed to hate somebody and to not like what they do just because of how they are right from what you've seen of them and it should be perfectly fine no one should kind of sit there and think oh man these guys wasted their time why do but it's like it doesn't waste it's it's a sort of it's a it's a source of entertainment it fills up your time 
um, it's maybe fun to laugh at people sometimes, especially the ones that you don't like. It makes complete sense why they would do it. Do you know what I mean? Especially the people that are on that subreddit all day long. I definitely understand why. But anyway, here's Joe Rogan basically eulogizing over Brendan Shaw. Big up the homeless cats for the clip and saying why he thinks he's such a good guy and why he likes him so much. And then I'll kind of comment it on the other side. He's um, he's a great dude. He really is. And he's a fun guy to be around. That's why all his friends love him so much. You yeah. Know, like people don't like him because he's he's, first of all, you know, whether you judge his comedy or judge his podcast or judge whether you also have to judge how he looks. And he's a beautiful man. And it's a real problem. For people. Guy. He's a beautiful man. And he's like six foot five. Great head of hair. He's <laughs> built like a fucking Someone Adonis. It really, it's, it really it makes people uncomfortable. Me included. I'm his friend. <laughs> He just has massive advantage. And the, the, you're going to hate on him. But he's a great guy. If he's you just the know sweetest him, he's guy a great in the guy. world. And I saw him getting hurt. And I was like, he doesn't really want to do this anymore. But he's doing it. So, I think part of the reason why people hate Brendan Schub a lot is because it's twofold, right? Because I think there needs to be an acceptance, I think, with most people or with some adults out there, especially people that work normal jobs and actually live the real full life. You would known, you'd have known if you've gone through your travels and gone through your career trajectory and friends, you know, lost some, made some relationships, broken up, extended some, you know, lost connections with some loved ones that you didn't really care for in the first place, right? But regardless, right, you would know across your time in life or across your journey in life, you would have known or come across people who have been very undeserving of whatever success they've gotten. They've just happened to luck into things. I think of somebody very similar to this sort of story. It's weird one to make connection, but think of John Jones, right? He has become successful or maintained a level of success despite his many fuck-ups, despite his many flaws. Obviously, there will come a time when he won't be able to... Um, he won't be able to get away with it, quote unquote. But he's been able to get away with it for the majority of his life, not because he's lucky, not because he's been touched by God or whatever, or because it's like his purpose or his no, not because, not because he's done it intentionally, but because it's just pure luck, right? Let's say that, yeah, let's go back. Just because it's pure luck. That's why he's been able to kind of skirt through life that way. And there's no denying that pretty much Brendan Shaw wouldn't be the person that he is now without that Joe Rogan cosign. And the disappointing thing about it, Jerry and Cosa, because, you know, people say, oh, so what? Jerry and Cosa is Jerry and Cosa. And if he was your friend, you'd love it too. Of course I'd love it. But the only really sad thing or the disappointing thing about Jerry and Cosa with Brendan Shaw specifically is that he hasn't really used it to kick on in a way that would make you think, okay, cool. Now he is kind of, I wouldn't say self-made, but he's kind of solidified himself and he's got to where he's need to get to and he's doing the best, you know, what he can do with his abilities. If anything, he's regressed a little bit from the Fox days. No, he's not a little bit, he's regressed a lot. And he's constantly, especially when he does the Below the Belt show, you're constantly reminded, you're like, wow, man, this guy legitimately gets paid money from a, you know, from a proper network they cut him a check every month to sit there and basically read through wikipedia fight cards and not really analyze fights not really recap fights properly mispronounce people's names and just be completely i wouldn't say um tapped out but he sort of phones it in and it's disappointing more so because he's a former ufc heavyweight right top 15 rank top 10 rank, i'm not sure which one it was uh, a fairly you know at the time he was fighting the standard was fairly high it wasn't maybe as good as it is now but it was still a good standard um, he obviously had that pub very public spat with Dana White where they didn't like each other for some legit reasons. He had some really good insights on the business of the UFC and how it should maybe go forward. Um, you know, there was real good scope for him to be a really interesting sort of person to go and get your MMA news from because of the experience he's had. Because not a lot of people can say they were legit UFC former fighters. Not a lot of people can say that they're a legit comedian. All these, like, all these things that sh they should add to his kind of understanding or how or how to of his understanding of the sport or how to articulate himself he doesn't do he doesn't take advantage of and it gets back to the thing of like i say before most people can recognize when life just isn't fair right when somebody like a sorry like, like a brendan Schulb comes around who quite clearly I wouldn't say he's undeserving but he's clearly not um he's clearly only there because of the network of friends that he has which is a benefit a great i'm sure he wakes up every single day and thanks to lord jesus christ that he met joe rogan because like i said i don't think he'd be the person that he is now without that joe rogan cosign it definitely allowed him to make tens of millions of dollars over the years and drive a purple porsche i mean he must be laughing about it every single day but those reasons are pretty easy reasons to not like somebody especially in comparison to people in his own 
career or you know um area of kind of yeah in his in his kind of interest in terms of profession wise when it becomes a stand up comedian it only makes sense that if you spend all your time following all these stand up comedians and you're hearing them talking about busting their ass going to open mics doing the road struggling for ages and then getting a break after 10 12 years it's only natural for you to then look at the person who got a special after 3 years and it was complete trash couldn't take the feedback from the back of it turned everybody in that that kind of gave him negative feedback into trolls or constructive feedback into trolls and is the most prickly self-absorbed kind of guy now at the moment where you just can't stand anything of his content that's where i kind of think it's a bit odd but again um i understand if your friends were to do it and you've met him in real life he must be like you know a gentleman i'm sure he must be a cool dude to hang around with especially if you're in la and you've got something to offer i'm sure he's going to be very very nice to you but in general I think if you don't know the dude and you just see clips of him on the homeless cat subreddit, so the Fire and the Kids subreddit, you should be allowed to form your opinion that way. You should. You should be allowed to say, like, you know what, fuck this guy, not for me. You should be perfectly fine. And he should be fine too to say back to you, yeah, fuck you, I'm going to keep making this money. That's the thing that he forgets to do. He's so kind of wrapped up around, you know, inoculizing himself from any sort of feedback that isn't something that he likes to hear. Like, look what happened to Ariel Hawani stuff. He didn't have a way to articulate himself and to rebuttal what Ariel was saying. And he just got to a point where he just stopped replying. Just stopped replying, kind of cut it out, covered his ears, covered his eyes. La, 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 it's not happening. And that's what basically he's done, with this, even with his comedy going forward, right? So, I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't get it. I get it some ways. You know, again, it is what it is. You've got to protect your friends. And if he's getting a lot of stick online, I understand it. But it's clear why people hate the dude. His comedy isn't great, but he gets all these big platforms. His podcast now has gone complete shit. He does do some, you know, you know, some sucky stuff at the moment with some people. And maybe there's also, there might be some people also, again, I'm not American, so I don't know. But maybe there might be some guys out there also who have like a bias or they kind of have something against him in general because he kind of reminds them of somebody they grew up with in school. Maybe he was a jock, the bully guy that kind of roughed you up a little bit at lunch that you always hated. Maybe, I don't know, there might be an element of that. I doubt it really. Um, dudes don't really hold on to stuff like that for that long and kind of, it, or if they do hold on to it, they just internalize it. They wouldn't kind of um, show it in that way in terms of writing on the Fire and the Kids subreddit every single day. But again, what do I know? move on from that one um yeah this is an interesting one we've got a development here courtesy of oh, sorry mma fighting yeah we've got an update here courtesy of mma fighting about john jones recent arrest off the back of him going to be inducted in the usc hall of fame for the fight against alexander alexander gusterston and you know of course you put john jones in las vegas with alcohol coke and women and you know only one thing's gonna occur. You know only one thing's gonna occur. So MMA fighting got a hold, I guess, of the mugshot of John Jones on the night um, that that transpired. And unfortunately, it looks like Father Time has hit John Jones on the face like it does with all of us. Obviously, most of the facial scarring and the, just the inflammation and stuff might come from just booze and bulking up and years of being punched in the face when he's fighting. Obviously, he's got extensive cauliflower ears, especially on the right, and his eyes just, ears just tend to protrude. But in general, his face does look very old and very haggard. He's not the same John Jones that we you know, saw first burst on the scene, you know, spinning wheel kicks, all this sort of crazy shit. Like, he's not the same guy. He's obviously changed somewhat. And again, it's just sad as a fan of the sport to see somebody that you adored getting older of course and also not getting older with grace that, i guess that's the thing that kind of hurts the most but let's continue with the article it says new details surrounding john jones recent arrests have been revealed after the police report from the incident was released to the las vegas police department MMA fighting obtained a copy of the report. According to the report, officers responded to a domestic disturbance at the Caesar Palace after a call stating that a white woman adult later identified as John Jones' fiance, Jesse Moses, was bleeding from the nose and the mouth. That's one thing we don't talk about too often, I guess, because she's a civilian and no one, she hasn't really put herself in front of the media like that. But we have to give Jesse um, Moses, John Jones' fiance, a lot of credit. And just a lot of love and adoration just for being with the dude. I don't know how long they've been, quote unquote, engaged for and soon to be married. I'm assuming it's probably a long time. But the fact that she's been with this dude through all the uh, up, all the highs, of course, and definitely lows of lows. And sort of kept a low profile and not kind of turned herself into a victim and used it as an opportunity to kind of, you know, siphon off some cash from John Jones, get a book deal, go on a tour, do podcasts. She hasn't done none of that. She just silently 
and stoically kind of absorbed and taken in all the abuse she's been taking in at, at you know at home at the hands of somebody who's meant to be her protector and stuff is just obscene obscene people don't talk about it enough honestly because of john jones is a star of course but just imagine his family man like god damn it after police does he have daughters as well or something right um after the police arrived they was informed that the suspect had just left the property and was picked up by another unit outside the hotel where he identified himself as john jones police then said the former ufc fighter resisted arrest as he was being taken to, to custody it says as john jones was being detained he became irate smashed his head into the front of the hood of the las vegas police department patrol car leaving a medium-sized dent as well as chipping on some of the paint on the vehicle he headbutted the bonnet of a police car um jones um was later charged with injury and disabling a vehicle which uh due to the amount of damage done to the considered a felony in nevada um back in the caesar hotel caesar plaza sorry police made contact with moses who stated that they engaged with john jones then they have been together for uh, they engaged john jones they've been together for 17 years with two children together moses denied that she had been arguing with jones and added that, that around 11 30 p.m local time he went out with his friends while she stayed at the hotel motel room so of course she's covering up for him like most you know women at the, uh, who become victims of domestic violence seems to be a kind of running theme there's definitely more to it that you know i don't have time to discuss on here at the moment but it's just sad isn't it it really really is sad man um moses then stated that she was sleeping and jones can come back he was not very happy um and when asked if she would get physically attacked she let it says a little bit yeah um moses then claimed jones touched the back of my head and pulled my hair a little bit but that did not hit me or anything moses explained that jones allegedly grabbed her hair by accident because she was trying to leave the room police then observed the blood on the clothing and a bump on dried blood on the lower lip of physical altercation moses said that he was unaware that anything happened to her lip while adding i know they're really dirty yeah but so yeah obviously the details come out we realize you know the guy is a piece of shit it seems like for hitting his wife like that and then we get this person john jones on instagram came seemingly it looks like defending himself or something right and it's basically him on the bench press lifting some decent heavyweight uh weight there maybe there's a 225 not really too sure and it says i have way too much trauma to consume alcohol right my brain simply cannot handle it anymore i'll leave alcohol in my past forever Right, so he's supposedly this is John Jones coming out and telling us he's not to, he's not kind of he's not going to he's going to stop drinking allegedly. Next one says, "Turn this nightmare into the best thing that to ever happen in my life." Now is the time to work harder than, than ever. Now the devil means uh, what the devil means for God, God means for good. Right, and this says, "Be right back to on my horse." John Jones taking you know on the bench press. The interesting part about it is, especially now we've learned because I think this picture came out before the report. But it's interesting to see that there's nothing in this report or sorry in this post that john jones did where he mentions his family he mentions direct family he mentions his extended family and his wife and his kids none it's all i like here i have too much um trauma to consume alcohol i will handle every uh, I, will ha I will leave alcohol in my past this nightmare intro the hardest thing to happen in my life right like everything is me 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 he never really uh, you know offers a hand or sympathy or kind of condolences to anybody else which is maybe a hint of a true narcissist in that way he generally thinks he did nothing wrong in the situation like clearly and again maybe he didn't do anything wrong but the fact that you got in a situation where your wife is now having to lie to you to the police that might have been like some proof that you might have been a bit of a dick maybe 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 been a bit of a dick but again man it goes to show once you're like that guy which is why i said the other day about um john jones will never change because it's fairly impossible to change a part of your personality or how you look at the world, how you interpret what is around you later on in life. It's just near I've never seen it, which is, again, why I say because a lot of people always used to come up to me and ask me for advice, and I just never would bother or I'll give them vague answers because if they really wanted it, they'll just do it. And then once they come and ask you, it'll be like for a, a next step sort of thing. It won't be for like a, let's, I want to begin. I don't know where to start. What max should I get? All that sort of stuff is like, come on. You know what I mean? everyone's got google um everyone's got youtube i would imagine like it's not that difficult it really is not that hard um but yeah john jones out here being unremorseful as per usual you love to see it you love to see it um, bear with me one second bear with me one second
And we're back. Sorry about that. Had a little bit of a slight intermission there. Something went a little bit spicy on my end. But you know what? It doesn't matter. Hope you guys are well, wherever this may find you. Let's continue. Next on the list in terms of news articles, something really interesting has happened. TikTok has announced that they now have a billion active users on their app. One billion. Like, do you know how insane that is, that number? That they've got a billion people accessing that app and sitting down and watching their content. It's absolutely ridiculous. So big up all the creators on TikTok doing the damn thing. This is courtesy of TikTok here on the newsroom. It says, thanks for a billion. It says, as TikTok, our mission is to inspire creativity and bring joy. Today, we are celebrating that, um, that mission and our global TikTok community. More than 1 billion people around the world now come to TikTok every month. So they've got a billion active users every single month, which is definitely one of the key metric startups, and especially um, social media platforms like TikTok would use in terms of leveraging themselves to get extra funding or to get better brand deals or better terms on advertising, whatever it may be, right? Or partnerships and whatnot is your active users. How many, like, you know, same with revenue. How many people are actually coming to your account or to your app on a monthly basis? And I think if one example is true, if I'm not mistaken, at the height of like Clubhouse, it was somewhere in the millions, right? So it was kind of obviously an app that was already behind the velvet rope. You had to get invited to get on it. So it already kind of limits people that are going to get on it. It was only available on iPhone and it was about a million, I think, somewhere at its peak. And now I think it's about 100,000, right? It's kind of leveled out really, really low. So obviously this will greatly impact when it suddenly does, when it does get up for... When it is available on the public stock market, right, in terms of an IPO, it will affect that and it might affect their round of investment and whatnot. But that was a magic number they were throwing around. Like, oh my God, we've got a million people. We haven't even launched properly yet. So for TikTok to have one billion people on it is mad. But I think we should give that respect that it deserves. I'm on it only most so for browsing purposes. And I have to be honest, even though the content isn't for me, maybe it's a bit similar to Vine in the comedy factor, isn't necessarily something that I find that, that funny. You can't deny there's a very particular TikTok voice. There's a very particular TikTok type of content. And in general, the app is really enjoyable. You could easily waste an hour, two hours, just scanning through the discovery, especially the discovery. Once you've kind of interacted with a couple of posts, it does bring up loads of interesting things in your feed from, you know, cooking hacks to fitness things to little weird skits, like anything that just comes up on your feed that is really entertaining. The only thing that's a bit worrying on the app still in general is the... Um, is the fact that everyone on there is like under the age of like 18, right? You can feel a bit creeped out when there's like a really attractive girl in there swinging a bum around and you realize she's probably 16 years of age. It can kind of gross you out. So it probably isn't the best place to be if you're a creep or you have creep tendencies because it definitely will get awakened on that sort of app. But once you can get past all of that sort of stuff, just in terms of the pure entertainment value on the app, it's far more, It's you, you don't feel as cheap or you don't feel as if you've been robbed of your time. You don't feel as deflated as you would do when you're on like Twitter or Instagram. Um, it does really feel you with joy. I have to be honest. It is a really happy app. It's a bit too happy. It's like that friend you have in your group that's always kind of looking at life, you know, half glass full or sorry, half glass empty. Half glass full, whatever it is, wherever around. I always mess up that round, um, that analogy in it. I'm definitely sure it's half glass full, right? But you know that kind of friend that's always happy, clappy, isn't religious, but just seems to be a bundle of positive vibes and good joy. And you can never tell them it's a bad day in, in the world. Sort of like a human version of Ty from our AFTV. That can get a bit too, a bit weird after a while, but still, you can't deny that TikTok is a great place. It really, really is a great place. They've fucking smashed it. I can't lie. They continue. It says we are honored to be the home of immensely diverse community of families, small businesses and creators who transform into our favorite stars. TikTok has become the beloved life, sorry, the be become a beloved part of life for people around the world because of the creativity and authenticity of our creators. Our global community is remarkable in its ability to reach millions of people across generations from music, food, beauty, fashion to art, causes and everything in between. Culturally, TikTok's culture truly starts on TikTok. Whether you're in Singapore, Sao Paulo, Stockholm or Seattle, we celebrate you. I love that they mentioned um five key cities or four key cities that aren't like really major ones well known that you would be aware of right maybe that's part of their metrics they realize that actually their main creators or people that actually get stuff popping off on their app don't come from the obvious cities like paris new york berlin amsterdam bloody blah, blah blah they've kind of gone for these other ones it's quite cool it continues to the creators who inspire us um the artists who launch chart breaking chart breaking albums <laughs> sorry about that 
yeah, with the TikTok dances, that's become like a big thing now in terms of rollout. So imagine that. TikTok started out as a bit of a joke and now it's become such an integral part of culture that it's completely changed how the music business operates or how its relationship is, or it's changed how its relationship, it's changed the business, the music industry's relationship with social media because it's basically told them that they have to take it seriously and they're including, I'm assuming, part of their budget includes some sort of spend on, on TikTok, some sort of consultation with some dancers or, you know, people representing them, creating the dance itself, making it go viral, doing all that stuff. Like, all of that has become, like, an integral part of an artist's journey um, to sometimes relaunch careers. The ones I like the most are the relaunching ones when suddenly TikTok will get a hold of a fucking weird edit that someone made of a Kylie Minogue song, like a dance EDM edit, do like some sort of challenge towards it or dance it becomes a big thing and now this guy who you know was you know fading out into obscurity working no more job suddenly sees his kind of metrics going kapoop out of the blue he starts to get booked in all these different places because people want to leverage his tiktok fame um that he obviously has and it completely changes his life now it might not last forever but the fact that people get to kind of you know have their day in the sun for a little a little bit for for the creativity that they obviously um put out there in the world that wasn't maybe appreciated at the time that it came out is great to see they breathe new life into old songs into songs that lay dormant um into songs that people probably didn't think would be hits and they also launch the careers of other people too so it's great to see um the communities lift us up and all the people who keep us laughing and dancing thank you for making the journey so special the tiktok team and i'm assuming this is like a roundup video i'm not going to play it but i'm assuming that's billions of people counted but yeah one billion people man active users on the platform that is absolutely nuts big up tiktok big up tiktok moving on we have here an interesting story this is something you don't usually see too often this is courtesy of Hypebeast. And you know that brand, Gallery Department? The brand that used to make um, all the sweatpants with all the paint splatters on it and the sweat, yeah, sweat pants, sweat shirts, hoodies and all that stuff. And some Carhartt pants as well that were kind of reconstruct, deconstructed or reconstructed. They've decided to close shop, especially the fashion side of it, the apparel. And he's just focusing mostly on becoming an artist going forward, right? I'm assuming his background probably isn't fine art in general. But he decided to put that to the side and just pursue the art side, which is really interesting considering that this brand is, in my opinion, fairly overpriced for what it is. I think the pants and the hoodies and, you know, as a combo was like in the thousands, right? And it wasn't really that great of quality. But again, it's the interesting thing of like being able to take something super mundane, like a sweatshirt, like a pullover hoodie and sort of elevate into this level of like luxury but then purposely distressing it and fucking it up so that it looks like common people clothes right quote unquote um or basically you're, you're sort of like cosplaying as an artist because that's what people i think felt like they were doing because you don't necessarily paint yourself at home and you don't have your own studio and you're not actually about this life the best way to kind of make yourself look it's, it's sort of like wearing margella trainers right you wear margella army trainers with the paint splatters on them you know that it or like tabby boots or like Rick Owen shoes, it's sort of like a way of you to like let people know that you're into fashion without being head to toe in like off white or something, right? Or like big bold letters or big bold branding for like Burberry or Balenciaga. You wear these little things that signify that you know what's up, like a Stefan Cook, um, what you call it, strap on your bag, right? Like a certain belt. I'm not sure what the belt people wear at the moment, but there are these little things that you can do that sort of give people a little signal. It's sort of like a little dog whistle, like, yeah, I've got a passion for fashion. And I think Gary Department was the same sort of thing, right? It sort of kind of was like a little head nod. But then, of course, over time, it got, you know, um, it got sort of commercialized. People, those fakes of it, people wearing it all over the place. It just lost its kind of passage. But again, I'm not really the a biggest fan of wearing stuff that's been pretty stressed anyway. I think always think it looks a bit naff. And I, again, I always thought the idea of like wearing stuff that makes you look like you paint is just a beyond naff. That's what you might as well buy shoes that have been purposely scuffed to make it look like you skate. It's just too much for me. But I understood the appeal. And I also understood that it was very popular. It was making this guy a lot of money. So for him to say, you know what, I want to stop that side of things and focus on my art, that's crazily insane and also super commendable because it goes back to my heroes people like the Hiroshi Fujiwaras the Nigos the Janwa the uh, Junior Watanabe's the uh, Jun Takashi's obviously of Undercover there was a thing back in those days where they would start and like drop brands all the time I think even during the retail mafia days in New York people used to do it all the time I think of brands like Nom de Gear it never came back right they just make a brand in that period of time it probably doesn't work out for a many number of reasons partner for that's whatever it is and instead of trying to re re kind of kindle that magic they just let it be let it be what it let it be 
let it be what it was and kind of just move on to other things but then that then kind of gives that brand um it kind of um it gives it another lease of life makes people kind of like you know idolize and sort of like eulogize over that period of time more because you know you're not gonna get anything more of it so all this gary department stuff that you bought earlier on that took you maybe six weeks to receive or whatever it may be that's now gonna have a different sort of value a different sort of attachment to you now now that you know that the guy's not making it anymore so it's a very clever tactic that way but still super commendable that he decided to do this and i really do rate the dude so it's courtesy of hype it says um just the just just sway just way to say just way or just you just sway thomas announces closure of gary department following the abrupt closing of the flagship store accompanied by the going out business sign um founder and designer thomas has officially announced the closure of gary department despite its success in the last few years marked by the major long bond collaboration again fronted by offset and shit um delivered an official statement noting the end of the widely popular label and his withdrawal from the fashion industry it says i come before you today with an overwhelming amount of pride and gratitude over the four years we've started an unconventional path to express an artistic critique of the fashion industry founded on the basis of quality and industrial design we've been fortunate to gain continuous support from customers who are not only feel good enough about the product but actually believe in the company our core values of uh, built a culture that has allowed gary department to be a laboratory a catalyst for change we speak to this dissatisfaction dissatisfaction sorry with the monotony with the monotony of the fashion industry polluting not only our minds but the environment through mass media the ideology of consumerism is conflicting with our ethics and in environment involvement of the in conventional plane i detest making disposable product disposable product you detest making but then you make 600 quid f sweatpants and shit some people when it, when they when they get into their fashion speak like it's all gobbledygook for me but you know whether i'll let him rock from beginning gary department's focus has been making the best product while easing the burden of resource consumption i guess because they you know re-engineering stuff and repurposing old sweats and you know whatever i can understand that bit but the retail price of it and the fact that it was only worn by the quote-unquote cultural lease of the scene is you know kind of makes it sound a bit funny but anyway because each case is unique and deserves a unique solution i'm choosing to continue the practice of being an artist and withdraw myself from the fashion industry i truly appreciate your business and support and look forward to everyone continue journey with me on to, to i look forward to everyone joining me on this journey thank you so again he just bowed out gracefully man he decided that's it i'm moving on to other things and you really really cannot um blame the dude let's see let's see what the video says it says um everything must go directed by jk studio voiceover by the dude thomas let's see what he has to say i come before you today with an overwhelming amount of pride and gratitude over four years ago we started an unconventional path to express an artistic critique okay let's not play with that because i already i already played him i already read it out but yeah it's just him voice serving over the note stores closing 9 11 good day to kind of close the store going out of business going to primary everything must go so yeah in terms of branding and iconography it looks pretty cool how he's done it and obviously it looks like he's obviously enjoying his life sipping his nice lattes and cafes and just you know basking in the glory of making umpteen amount of teenagers around the world decide to buy 600 quid sweatpants because their favorite streetwear figure out there wore them but still it was the first person doing that kind of thing everyone then went on to copy it he did it in a really unique way cool way people seem to like the stuff because you know you wouldn't virgil for a time period was living in this sweatshirt and the sweatpants itself right they were all over the place so the fact that he was able to make things that people liked in that short period of time and make people kind of invested in it despite him being somebody that looks like you know he wouldn't necessarily wear that stuff himself still good, good to see another black guy thriving and decided to pivot away from the non-stop crazy world of fashion and into art because as much as we like to you know bang on about fashion and whatnot being an artist really is the greatest form of expression it really is a, probably the best occupation to be especially a contemporary artist, especially nowadays the barrier of entry is super low um you don't really have to compete with many great artists out there everyone's pretty mediocre so if you have anything special about you you will get far very very quickly um everyone wants to be everyone kind of wants to find the next kind of you know for, for lack of a better example the next basket so the fact that if you can get in there kind of you know finagle the right people you live out in la um have something something to say about the work that you're making have the work that you're making reflect maybe stuff that you're going through have a story behind it back get back by big galleries maybe do some independent stuff whatever right you can figure it out if you figure it out the money 
is insane. The, the, the you know again the invent the time you're investing and then the money you get back for the work you're producing, and again the lack of stress. Running a business, which is what he was doing with Gary Department, is very difficult and not for the faint heart, especially if you come into it being an artist first. Imagine if he came into it being an artist and he launched Gary Department as an as a way for him to kind of fund his art. Because a lot of people do do those sort of things, right? You do another thing that you don't really passionate about in order for you to fund the thing that you actually want to do in the hope that later on down the line, when that stuff becomes self-sufficient, you can then quit the stuff you don't like anymore, even if it is profitable. You just don't want to spend your time. That's what true creatives do. You don't really care about the money. You just want to get your voice and what your ideas are in your head out there into the public right um because that's exactly what you've been putting this earth to do so i would not be surprised if he came into it with those kind of you know naive sort of thoughts and then he got into it it's like rah boy running a business is mad shipping time people complaining about not getting the right stuff blah 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 it's just too much to get on um and it's taking away from time for doing his art so best way to do it is to kind of block the stop the fashion he could always come back later down the line there's no forevers in fashion and especially with the monies that are involved i'm sure someone will come up behind him and ask or offer to kind of buy him out so that they can you know license the brand and maybe do their own thing and sell it in-house itself i would hope he doesn't do that he just leaves it dormant so that he can kind of rekindle it himself whenever he wants to right one of the best things that i loved about adam kimmel even though he was one of my favorite designers and i was so bummed when he then ended up kind of quitting fashion i was so i was so happy he didn't end up licensing or selling his brand name it just kind of let it kind of you know um, die on its own obviously and then whenever he does decide if he does decide to come back into fashion he's got a brand with uh, all this legacy and history tied towards it um with no fluff and shitness in between to kind of clean up because that's what a lot of brands have to do and like imagine bape if Nigo ever comes back to Babe to try and rekindle that after IT have got it, he's going to have to get rid of a lot of shit that happened in between the time that he left and now. Um, and the best thing to do is just to kind of leave it be. So, you know, b big up that dude, uh, Mr. Thomas, just, how do you say? Jose? Hos, Hos, is they say Jose? How, how do you pronounce that name? Would, would it be Jos, Josue or Josue? How do you pronounce it? Is it Josue or Josue? Yeah, Jose, Josue, Josue. That's how you pronounce it anyway. But regardless, Josue Thomas um closing down his brand called gary department it was a huge brand at the time it did really really well and the fact that he's decided to pivot into just being a full-time artist is super commendable and hope that he becomes as successful as he was in the fashion in the art world and makes a bucket load of cash because it's great to see a dude you know just figure it out in the art world and just kind of bank um make absolute bank out there in it it's great to see it really is great to see especially when he's surrounded by really kind of you know um pretentious white people you know i mean having to kind of cater and bow towards a dude who's turning up in a flipping faithful dead um you know t-shirt and sandals and shit and kickboxing shorts it's just great to see visually i like i love seeing that shit i'm not gonna lie i'm not going to lie okay um and then we're gonna come yeah and then and then i think we're gonna continue on to this we really are in the moment we're gonna continue into this Sorry about that, I had to keep pausing stuff here and there because of some complications here at home, but everything should be back where it needs to be. Let's just carry on with a couple more topics and I'll let you guys get off and do your thing in it because sometimes listening to what I have to say maybe isn't the best way to go about things. Maybe isn't the best way to go about things. So, to kind of end, bit of crappy news really. Um, this news comes from NBC. It says, R. Kelly has been found guilty on all counts in his sex trafficking trial um you know this case is finally coming to an end um the witnesses who have obviously had to recount their stories and all the horrible ordeals they went through and having to withstand the abuse from all the pro r kelly fans out there that still exist which is wild i think outside the courtroom there was like a whole group of these older um black ladies blasting r kelly music on loop shouting out that the women were liars and hussies and hoes and harlots and whatnot like just imagine the world we live in now at the moment like that's what i've always said I think it's a crappy quote for myself exactly about, you know, the real enemy of all women is other women, not men, right? Um, you know, especially some women, feminists specifically, like to go on about how um, destructive um, the patriarchy is, which I obviously agree. There are elements of the patriarchy that are not conducive to a um, meritocracy, I guess, in the genders in terms of how people get ahead and don't get ahead in certain industries. I definitely understand 
that. But let's be real. The real person that's going to break, bring you down and cripple you or, cri yeah, cripple you definitely by your knees and your ankles is definitely going to be your fellow woman if you are a fellow woman, in if you are a professional lady, especially in a professional environment. Think about it. Working for a fashion magazine or in some sort of agency, who's the person that's really going to be the person that's going to put you down or make you not get to where you need to get to or kind of talk behind your back and sabotage your career? Yes, it could be your, you know, Jeffrey Epstein or yeah your Jeffrey Epstein Harvey Weinstein kind of character who's sort of like lying in the weight but usually it's your colleagues you work with yeah now, I mean talking behind your back ruining your reputation with gossip and rumors and then you get to a point where you just have enough and you quit and you go and do other things and it's no it's no kind of um it's no exception in this case you've got these older women outside the courthouse knowing what they know, knowing the extensive bits of information, knowing all the law, especially the Arkeli case, you have to imagine. There's all the actual stone hard or stone cold facts that we have at the moment during the court case has been obviously made public in some way or the other. Sorry about whether it's interviews or whatnot. But we also have all the law, all the rumours, all the stories, all the kind of like gossip behind the scenes we've heard over the years, right? Ever since that kind of mad um, story about the pet, about the piss and tape leaking i didn't i don't think i actually ended up watching it but regardless that thing existed people have seen it we've heard so many stories and they're all kind of corroborated in some way shape or form nothing that we heard so far from about r kelly kind of struck you as like oh no that's crazy right he didn't he wouldn't do that that doesn't sound like something he would do everything kind of matches up with him his persona what he presented what he said how he communicated the lyrics that he wrote like unfortunately because that's the that's the issue as well being a supremely talented artist in that way you use all those experiences and you funnel them into your music and that's what probably gives your music the layers and the textures and the the appeal and the sort of um and the sort of uh rever whatever it's called that whatever that x factor is in his music that was making him again one of the biggest stars in the day when he was obviously coming up is the fact that he was going through real shit right he's obviously got real trauma he's dealing with in his own regard but he was doing all that messed up nasty stuff we were hearing in the music that he was obviously singing about and rapping about in some cases so it's no surprise that some fans are just so enamored with him, especially when it comes to celebrities, especially in the US. You know, the way that they're obsessed with celebrities is next level. I don't think you'd get the same sort of reverence being held up for someone like a Jimmy Savile here in the UK. I don't think there's many pro Jimmy Savile supporters who say the kids were lying, right? I don't think they're going to either, they don't think they're willing to stick their head out of the parapet. And I just think in general, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm reading into this too wrong, it's a bit weird to say this, but. I think in general, the UK seems to have a little bit more sensitivity when it comes to like kitty fiddling, when it comes to like dealing with underage girls. We don't seem to forgive that easily. I think the US, not, not to say that they forgive it easily, but there's less of a like, there's less of like a stone cold, like you're out of here. No one's ever rocking with you whatsoever because it's just honestly strange to see people like fighting his case or making all these what ifs and that not. It's like, is this the hill you want to die on? You want to deal on the R. Kelly hill? Like, that's a weird hill to die on. Yes, he might have had some issues growing up and he definitely um, was abused in some way, shape or form. But still, he was doing this like way into his like adult years, way into his like granddad years. Yeah. And um, later on down the line, at one point, there has to be some form of personal accountability. But if ever there's a place where uh, accountability, um, not taking accountability is definitely something that people use, um, overuse, it's definitely the States. People love overusing personal accountability. It's always your family, it's always your upbringing, it's always your mental health, stress, like all these things. They love to kind of self-diagnose um, themselves in that regard. But anyway, the, the, the justice system came in and basically um, did away with all that. And he's now been found guilty. The article says the following. R. Kelly, the R&B superstar, has long been trialed by accusations of sexual misconduct and abuse. Um, the deal was found guilty in New York on the Monday of all counts in a high-profile sex traffic case, capping a trial that featured hours of graphic testimony from the accusers. Just imagine being in a jury and having to listen to all those accounts. It must be horrible anyway, in general. But it, obviously, with his profile and given the severity of the crimes and the amount of years involved, it's just... Ugh. Kelly, who's been in custody for much of the time um, since he was formally charged, charged in 2019 has convicted on one count of racketeering and eight counts of violating the man act the law that bows transporting people across state lines for any immoral purpose i'm surprised again maybe it's different i don't know if he's got loads of felonies because he's an r&b superstar and he's got money and shit i'm surprised that his lawyers weren't didn't manage to get him to like be out on bail um pending the trial i'm not sure why that didn't happen because in some case it does, some case it doesn't. Like I, I, I just don't see how that goes. I don't. Maybe I've done some justice system in general, because it made me think of the Brian Laundry thing, right? 
more often than not, in those cases where you're a missing spouse goes missing, I think I don't I don't know if it's like um sorry, a spouse goes missing, usually I think it's like ninety percent of the cases, it's usually somebody that they know. And then I guess from there, it's usually 80 or 70. It's usually like, you know, a past boyfriend or the current, you know, partner or whatnot. So I just find it crazy that he was able to go with his, you know, wife or wife-to-be to go and do this whole like van life thing. He comes back. He doesn't he doesn't come back with her. A tape, a, a tape emerges with them getting some kind of altercation. And he isn't basically held until they can get more evidence or whatever just something right they don't they can't hold them at all they don't charge them nothing happens whereas in our kelly's case i don't know again with this stuff like of course he's been accused of some serious crimes but until he has his day in court why should he not be out on bail why does he have to spend you know all that time in jail like, i don't understand why the difference is in that regard i really don't get what the difference is why is one guy allowed to go home go on a hike and then disappear and one guy has to sit in jail for it it just seems a bit bizarre but maybe it's different maybe i don't understand it if you if you know any more information let me know in the comments i really appreciate it it says um uh today's ver guilty verdict forever by brent scar kelly a predator who used his fame and fortune to prey on the young vulnerable and voiceless for his own sexual gratification the act um jacqueline calusia said the statement to all the victims in this case your voice was heard justice was finally served and we hope that today's verdict brings um, a measure of comfort and closure to the victims kelly 54 who is decades in prison when he's sentenced in may 4th next year so he's still gonna be in, in jail until that date like it's been a long time before he gets sentenced crazy where a mask gonna appear stoic as the verdict was read out aloud in u.s district court in brooklyn i would imagine at this point because he's not doing what that like, you're ruining my life man what sort of shit i think he's probably come to terms with what he's done he's had time to reflect because i think a lot of those people who generally do these bad and evil and disgusting things i generally do think as i've been looking at some kind of you know bad actors online and stuff i generally do get the impression they honestly don't think they did anything wrong right they honestly think they are okay they're in the right what was what, what everyone panicking over they didn't think they did anything wrong there's no issue with it but mostly it's because they're in the moment of the thing right they're bouncing from time they're bouncing around they're going from day to day and they're just trying to distract themselves from having to sit down for a minute and reflect on what they did because if they do it's going to fill them with dread and obviously this prolonged period in time in jail awaiting your sentencing awaiting your trial wherever it may be has definitely given time to reflect and be like you know what Maybe I am the monster they're painting me out to be. Even though he probably doesn't still believe he's guilty, he's come to he's come to terms to accept where he's at. And it's very unlikely, despite, you know, I'm not sure how he's still got the money to keep all these flipping lawyers on flipping retainer anyway, in general. He must have made a bucket load of cash when he was popping. But it seems like he's generally decided, you know what? Maybe this is where I just kind of throw my hands up and just leave it. You know what I mean? And whatever happens, whatever happens. Uh, because there's not, you don't really hear much from him. Um, I guess you hear stuff from his lawyers saying they're going to fight stuff but obviously that's just lawyers talk it seems like but you don't really hear as much vigour and vim from him um, since I don't know the last couple of times when he was trying to get out on the back of COVID and stuff which is great to see um, that the justice system and you know those kind of facilities especially for somebody a celebrity like him can be a place where you can finally maybe stop your bullshit stop lying to yourself and finally say enough is enough let me because that's the thing as well you got away with these crimes for all these years this is your punishment mate it is what it is even if you would have got out that time you spent in was enough to it should be enough to kind of put a stop to it right and just be like look this is the reality of it like, people look at you as a monster you're a pariah in the society same with um, bill cosby he's come out he tried to go on tour you haven't really heard much about the tour since then it's because he's realized that you know no one wants to hear your voice like sponsors are probably not lining up to you know advertise or sponsor or have their name associated with him insurance all this sort of stuff is kind of getting in the way it's a lot of money to move somebody like him around with security and all that stuff it's just you, I, I think those, as much as sometimes those Bill Cosby sentences can be annoying how he gets out that way, I honestly do think the having to live with that internal hell of knowing that everyone views you one way, you, even though you view yourself one way, everyone knows who you are actually, they've kind of been, your secrets are in the dark, have been exposed to everybody in that regard, I think that's enough shame and enough punishment to make those people's lives an internal hell in that regard. That's what I believe. Again, it would be nice and swift. They could be buried under the prison, but sometimes just having them kind of face their consequences of these sort of things is enough, should be enough to kind of condemn them to eternal damnation, if that makes any sense. Um, 
It says here, Kelly didn't say much of anything after the verdict was announced. His attorney, Derek Kerner, told reporters he was shocked. Kelly, best known for his 996 hit, I Can Believe I Can Fly, pleaded not guilty to all charges. The singer's real name is Robert Sylvester. Kelly did not take the stand in his own defence. Gerard Griggs, a lawyer who said that represents several of Kelly's accusers and families, thanked his clients for their immense strength and expressed his gratitude to the prosecutors. This is just the beginning. We've been fighting this battle since 2017 and many victims have been fighting this battle for years. The prosecutors in the trial, which centred on allegations of six people said Kelly had serial sex predator who abused young women as well as underage girls and boys for more than two decades so yeah man he's gone in it it's over for him sayonara um good riddance i say and hopefully other sexual predators within the music industry specifically entertainment industry will be brought to justice too because let's not make any bones about it there are far more people out there that need to be brought to justice and um, people have taken advantage of people um you know use their a bit use their kind of ability to kind of call shots and to gatekeep in order to kind of exchange sexual favors and just de you know um bring people down to their knees figuratively um you know and metaphorically like it's just not the not the time not the time at all and it's good to see people again finally brought to justice anyway that's your Action Zing Show episode number 501. Thanks again for joining in. It's been a pleasure to have your company. I'm going to leave you for now and be back again later. But if you're listening to this via the podcast app, please make sure you leave me a five-star review or four or three or two or one. I'll be much appreciated and share the show with your family and friends. If you're, listening, if you're watching via the podcast app or for the YouTube, sorry, smash the like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. And of course, support via Patreon. is always more than welcome at patreon.com. For just Agassino, you'll be able to find the link in the description of this podcast, wherever you're watching or listening to it. Patreon.com. For just Agassino, register for a little as one dollar equivalent of one pound per month you get access to all my patreon content on there patreon content is uploaded every week i've got a content uploaded early i'm going to upload the content again at the end of this week so make sure you jump on there get involved don't delay and i'll see you guys again very very soon thanks again for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have you here again take care peace